Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksa, Secretary to the Ministry of Defense and Urban Planning, Commander of the Army, Lieutenant General Dara Naika, Commanders of the other forces, distinguished visitors from overseas who are participants in this seminar, ladies and gentlemen. What I want to say to you, first of all, is that our country has a singular strength of vibrant institutions. We have gone through difficult times, but during those periods of trauma and travail, the country's institutions have served us well. One of the principal institutions very relevant to the contemporary condition of Sri Lanka are the armed forces of the Republic. And that is why I am particularly happy about this initiative, the Defence Seminar, which brings together people from different countries interested in Sri Lanka's contemporary experience, the methods which we used to overcome terror, and how it was that we engendered an environment in which the country now has the capability to accelerate its economic and social development. What is happening in many parts of the world which are manifesting unprecedented turbulence shows that there is a design on the part of certain groups and interests to destabilize institutions. And it serves the interests of these groups to drive a wedge between the armed forces and the people of our country. That is something that we have to be perennially vigilant about. There is absolutely no room for complacency. Now I have just returned last evening uh, from a very brief visit, a 48 hour visit uh, to the United Kingdom during which I had the opportunity of engaging with, fun of the, with some of the finest legal minds in the world, gathered at a very prestigious symposium in the University of Cambridge. And soon after that, I met several high commissioners in London and also addressed the British and international media at the Sri Lankan High Commission in London. Now, I want to tell you about some of the themes which I developed at these interactions. One of these is this phenomenon. There is a great deal of misinformation and propaganda about the role of the armed forces in our country and their current status in the northern province of the island. I regret to say that some of this misinformation is reflected very strongly in the report of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, the comments that she made at the conclusion of her visit. Without any intention of giving offense and motivated not by anger or indignation, but by a sense of profound sadness at the degree of distortion, I would like to make the following remarks about the role of the armed forces. Mrs. Pillay says that the presence of the army in the north, to quote her own words, she uses the phrase intrusive and oppressive. 
to use as a trade. There could not be a more unjustified or inaccurate statement. This is not what I am saying. The most convincing refutation of that assertion comes from authoritative documents prepared by the United Nations system of which Mrs. Pillay is a member. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees and the United Nations Office dealing with humanitarian assistance, the coordination of humanitarian assistance, OTRA. These organs of the UN system have carried out a detailed survey of public attitudes and perceptions in the northern province of Sri Lanka. They interviewed 197 people selected at random, not by the government of Sri Lanka, but by the UN system. I would invite all of you who are present here today, please, to have a look at those documents. We do not mind criticism, but there must be a sense of basic justice and fairness. Those are fascinating documents. With my own hands, I handed them over to Mrs. Pillay during a 90-minute meeting that we had. Now, the questions posed by the United Nations officials to the people of the North are the following. This is just a sample. I'm speaking from memory. Questions are asked, precisely this, do you find the presence of the army to be an interference with your daily lives? And the answers are tabulated. 90% of the people of Jaffna answer that question emphatically in the negative. They're saying far from the army being an encumbrance or an impediment, they are a source of comfort. With my own eyes, I have seen during visits to the north, the army constructing not only houses, but toilets. No government in any part of the world can ask its army to undertake work of that nature. But this was the extent of the humanitarian contribution by the Sri Lankan army, which played a very powerful catalytic role in a difficult transition in the north from a society in conflict to a society that is stable and moving forward. So these are the views and the perceptions of the people of the North as expressed to officials of the United Nations system. It is all there in that document. And what is the cause for profound regret? Again, I stress that this is not being said in anger or by way of retaliation, but it is a matter of deep sadness for us that so distinguished an official of the United Nations system as the High Commissioner for Human Rights chooses to ignore this relevant and indeed compelling evidence that was placed in our hands. Not one word, not one word about the UN's own assessment of the role of the army vis-a-vis the community, the public of the North. Then apart from what she says on that subject, she goes on to say specifically that there are cases of sexual harassment in the North. Now I want to tell you, this is a good forum for me to tell you this directly. Some of the questions that are asked are, the UN is asking the people of the North, when male members of your household are away from home, do the female members feel comfortable? Or do they feel in some way insecure? And again, the responses are totally unequivocal. We feel totally comfortable. Why then is it that the evidence given to the UN system by the people of the North are totally disregarded and 
Conclusions which are arrived at in advance are incorporated into the statement. So this is why I say that we are dismayed by the kind of approach that has been adopted to the preparation of this document and the comments that were made at the time of its presentation to the media. All of this is happening, in my view, because the armed forces and their role are being looked at from the prism of a different culture. Today in the North, the army is playing a humanitarian role. It is not fighting a war. There is no violence there. There is no oppression, coercion or duress. There is no need for it, nor is there any appetite for it on the part of the armed forces or anybody else. But I say to you in all honesty that had it not been for the role which the army is now playing in the northern part of the country, the transition that is taking place before our very eyes in the north would have taken a great deal longer than it is taking now. Because the army is helping with the construction of physical infrastructure. It is helping with the provision of water for agricultural pursuits. It has played a role of inestimable value in bringing about a situation in which elections can be held after a quarter of a century for provincial councils in the northern part of the country. These things do not happen fortuitously or gratuitously. They happen because of a tremendous effort that has been invested and among those who have made that effort are the armed forces of the Republic. Now what is equally distressing is the practice of some segments of the United Nations system and this is reflected very much in the work of the High Commissioner for Human Rights during her visit to Sri Lanka. The refusal to apply to Sri Lanka standards which are said to be applicable across the board. If there is genuineness, if there is honesty and sincerity, there must be consistency, uniformity. Why is there a highly selective and subjective approach adopted to my country? What is the justification for that? I don't know whether you are aware that 40 years have elapsed since the Bloody Sunday massacres in Northern Ireland. Forty years. How long has it taken to investigate those? Who has been brought to justice? And who has been punished? At the end of the conflict in Northern Ireland, there was, of course, a political agreement that was entered into. That was 14 years ago. Have all garrisons, the military apparatus, been dismantled? Not at all. It is just happening 14 years after a political agreement was entered into. These are not zero-sum situations. You cannot draw an arbitrary line and say that all violence belongs to the past. Just two weeks ago, there was a very distressing incident there. And several members of the police force, more than 50 police officers, suffered. Why then is it that this degree of impatience is visited upon Sri Lanka solely and exclusively? These long periods, 40 years, 14 years, are entirely acceptable, are not considered worthy of comment or condemnation in other situations. When the Lessons Learned and Reconciliation Commission report was out, I was asked ad nauseam by representatives of some countries, when are you going to publish it? I said, we have nothing to hide. We will publish it. I was then asked, but are you going to publish only portions of the report? Or will you publish it in its totality? 
I said, we are not going to be selective and discriminating. We will publish the whole report. And it happened. Now, has the Shilcott report been published? That is an authoritative inquiry into the conduct of the Iraq war. As I address you today, that report has not yet been published. So Sri Lanka is under tremendous pressure. We don't need that pressure. Voluntarily, spontaneously, of our own accord, we were going to publish that report. But why are the people who are crying out for transparency, visibility, these are very good things. And we have not been founding, we have not been found wanting in that respect. We published our report in full. Why are they not clamoring for the publication of the Shilcott report? Other parts of the world have lived through these periods of excruciating pain. Take Chile and Argentina as examples. The events of the 1980s and 1990s were gone into only a few years ago. So why this highly discriminating treatment? This is something that we do not understand and something that we deeply regret. Now, in order to assess, my friend Dr. Sarah Damanugama has just joined us as a very eminent sociologist. I'm sure he would agree with me that if one sets out to assess and evaluate a situation with any degree of objectivity, a certain frame of mind is indispensable. There must be basic fairness. There must be a willingness to look at the empirical evidence and to come to conclusions on the basis of the facts as found, without prejudgment, without preconceptions. That is a basic yardstick. If that is not conformed to, there cannot be any equity or fairness characterizing the conclusions which are reached. Now let us look at some of the other portions of this document. I said this to BBC in London. Hindu was present from India. It was a representative sample of people from media and from think tanks. Now, in that document, there are two epithets that are used to describe the LTTE. One is murderous. It is described as a murderous organization. The other is the adjective ruthless. It is characterized, quite rightly, as a ruthless organization. Mrs. Pillay says that the only previous occasion on which she visited Sri Lanka was to attend a commemoration of the late Dr. Neelan Tiruchelvam, whom both Dr. Sarat Amanugama and I knew very well. Neelan Tiruchelvam entered the University of Peradeniya just one year before I did. And at the conclusion of our undergraduate degrees, he went to Harvard University on a Fulbright scholarship. And I proceeded to Oxford University on a Rhodes scholarship. Our paths crossed again in 1994 when we entered parliament together. So Mrs. Pillay says she came to this country. The only occasion on which she has visited was to attend a commemoration for Niran Tiruchelvan, who rightly commands her unmitigated respect. Now, if this organization is murderous and ruthless and killed Neelan, among many others, as he undoubtedly did, how then does it make sense to want to go to the place where Prabhakaran met with his death in order to place a floral tribute in Mulli Vaikal? By all means, we grieve all those who lost their lives, all of them, members of the armed forces, members of the public, everybody. But surely, if the expression of grief must encompass all the victims of the conflict, Prabhakaran was responsible for probably 180,000 deaths in this country, then how does it make sense to choose Mulli Vaikal as a place 
for a floral tribute. So these are the patent contradictions which impinge fundamentally on the basic sense of objectivity, which is a condition precedent for an acceptable analysis of any set of circumstances. And this runs right through not only this particular documentation, but indeed the entire handling of the situation by the High Commissioner. In answer to a question that was put to her by a representative of the media, she referred to the panel of experts report. This was a panel appointed by the Secretary General of the United Nations system just to inform himself. It was not an official UN document. It did not emanate from any intergovernmental process. High Commissioner Pillay, however, states that the report contains facts. She uses the word facts. Is that fair? To condemn my country on the basis of this report, which is said to encapsulate facts. Let's look at the way this document was compiled. Those who compile the document say themselves, it is not a matter of implication or inference, it is explicitly stated in the body of the report that they gathered evidence from persons who offered to give this evidence, but on the condition that their anonymity is preserved for 20 long years. As somebody who has been involved in the law for a very considerable part of my life, I would say that there is a total travesty of the basic norms of natural justice and procedural fairness. If you can gather evidence from people who are prepared to talk to you only on the condition that they are allowed to lurk in the shadows, their identity will not be known for a whole generation. What then is the filtering process that is available? How can you ascertain the veracity or the dependability of what is said to you? That is how that document was prepared. And Mrs. Pillay tells us that the document contains facts. It will also be of interest to you, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, to be told how that document, compiled by so-called experts, characterizes the LTT. The LTT whom Mrs. Pillay herself describes as murderous and ruthless. But the report of the panel of experts describes the LTT. You will be amazed at this, but this is true. The LTT is described as the most disciplined and nationalist organization. Yes, it is there in the report. It is the most disciplined, now if that is uh, one's idea of discipline and nationalism, one shudders to contemplate the future of this planet. So that is a document which is elevated to a sacrosanct level. It is digni dignified by the High Commissioner by incorporation of that absolutely flawed document into the formal documentation of the United Nations system, because when she reported to the Human Rights Council a few months ago, she quoted that report. Up to that time, it was, a, it was not an official document at all. Now, is this course of action fair by a country which has done something that the world thought well nigh impossible? The Federal Bureau of Investigation of the United States has described the LTT as the most ruthless terrorist organization in the world. At that time I was in government and the advice that we were consistently given was that the Sri Lankan army and the other forces may be able to win a skirmish or a battle, but if there is any idea of overcoming this movement by military means, that was a dream. It would never happen. But thanks to the political will of President Rajapaksa, Secretary Gotabe Rajapaksa, and the selfless devotion of the armed forces and the support of the public during that crucial period in the country's contemporary history, what was thought to be impossible was achieved. And now the country, at the conclusion of that painful conflict, is back on its feet and moving forward. 
Now, is this the attitude that we are entitled to expect from the world outside? What we want is partnership, goodwill, cooperation. By all means, we are not saying that nobody should interfere, nobody, it is not anybody else's business, leave us alone. We are not saying that. But is this the spirit in which what is loosely described as the international community, is not the international community at all, it is only one section of it, is that the spirit in which we would expect them to engage with us. Now there's one other comment I want to make on this document and the comments that were made on it. And that is a very damaging statement that was made. That, that statement was made, I say, deliberately. And what is the statement? That uh, Sri Lanka is moving towards an increasingly authoritarian regime. That is a very detrimental statement. It was made calculatedly and deliberately and it hit headlines in different parts of the world. Is that at all justified? I tell you, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, that for 25 years, this country had four governments, it had four presidents. Nobody held the provincial council elections to the northern province. Nobody held those elections. Now, after 25 years, President Rajapaksa is holding those elections on the 21st of September. In other words, this is political empowerment. And it is done sequentially and coherently. Having addressed the humanitarian concerns connected with, international, with internally displaced people, ex-combatants. Incidentally, out of 3,600 people, only about 350 are now in custody. These are people who took up arms against the state. They have all been released. Mrs. Pillay does not talk about that. But only says that the release of the others needs to be expedited. Is that balanced? Does it have any sense of poise, of balance, of equilibrium? And the others are going to be charged. The TID has completed its work. And there are people who are accused of serious offenses, but less than 350 out of 3,600. So that is the attitude. Whatever is perceived as a deficiency or shortcoming is highlighted. And legitimate achievements, which are incontrovertible, are glossed over, or acknowledged, belatedly and grudgingly. That is why I confess to a profound sense of sadness in looking at this situation. So I told you that after 25 years, President Rajapaksa has had the courage to hold the elections in the North, to give the people of the North the opportunity to exercise their suffrage and to elect freely and voluntarily their representatives in the Northern Provincial Council. What is the litmus test, the barometer of a functioning democracy? Regular elections. Sri Lanka is a country where every six months you have an election. President Rajapaksa has held an election in this country every six months. Provincial Council elections, Pradesh Sabha, that is local government institutions. So, it is not once in six years. You know, critics of the British system have said that the British people are free only once in five years. But the Sri Lankan people perennially have the opportunity of passing judgment on their government. And at every one of those elections, President Rajapaksa's party has been returned with greater majorities. The president said in a recent statement, I read about it, uh, today, he has said that in um, eight years, he has held 11 elections. Now, is that the hallmark of an authoritarian regime? So, that particular statement, damaging as it is, is fictitious. It is not founded upon any substratum of fact. It is grossly unfair by a country and unworthy of a high official of the UN system. Now, very quickly, I want to share with you, your topic is um, regional, the post-conflict challenges and regional stability. I tell you that the defeat of the LTT has enabled us all to live freely, to breathe the air without fear, and to set about our daily lives. But it is not a matter that is 
only of significance to the people of our island republic. It has a far wider significance. If you, you're, you're talking about regional stability. The stability of the entire subcontinent has been powerfully reinforced by this terrorist organization being vanquished. These are overlapping, interlocking mechanisms. If the LTTE were alive and kicking today, that would have had a very significant impact on stability and tranquility in the entire region. Now, this afternoon, I'm speaking at uh, a function with which my friend is closely associated, Dr. Amunugama, that is the uh, South Asian Economic Summit. Uh, there are distinguished personalities of South Asian governments represented there. In all those countries, the situation would not have been what it is today had it not been for the destruction of the LTT. The destruction of the LTT, an admittedly terrorist organization. Now, how are we contributing to that regional stability apart from the defeat of the LTT? This country is doing more than its fair share when it comes to preserving the peace of the region and indeed of the world. We have had this very distressing situation involving the boats carrying illicit, illicit uh, immigrants into countries like Australia. Sri Lanka does not have infinite resources, but recognizing the magnitude, the enormity of the problem, the tragedies of Christmas Island, these are people who are being duped by unscrupulous elements. They are putting their lives at risk. They are prevailed upon to part with their life's savings. The role of the Sri Lanka Navy has been handsomely acknowledged by the government of Australia. And the Sri Lankan Navy has played a role which is, I say, indispensable in curtailing the fallout from this problem. So we have played our role in ensuring the security of sea lanes, the integrity of transnational commerce, all of which are essential for stability and prosperity of the world in which we live. Now, in order to make our point of view understood by the world at large, President Rajapaksa has taken the leadership in taking a critical look at our priorities in structuring our diplomatic relations. Since 1948, since we achieved independence from the British, we have not really stood back and taken a critical look at our diplomatic representation abroad. For the first time, President Rajapaksa has attached a new significance to our relations with large swaths of the globe particularly the continent of Africa and countries in Latin America. During my 48-hour visit to London, I met high commissioners of several countries from the Caribbean, from Africa, and also from Asian countries. And I tell you with a sense of legitimate pride that our country's position, its problems, the manner in which we are grappling with those problems, Today, for the first time, there is a proper understanding of those issues across the globe, across the globe. And this was very strongly articulated by representatives of African and Caribbean governments whom I met in London yesterday. So these are the thoughts that I want to share with you. Sri Lanka is a world leader. I think there is a lot to learn from our experience in several areas. The role of youth. We are hosting a major event in the middle of November, the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. And the President was particularly keen that we choose as a theme a matter that is of immediate relevance and importance to the people of this country as a whole. That is why we chose economic development with social equity. The upliftment of conditions among rural youth and the equitable distribution of the fruits of development, not confined to urban areas, but in all parts of the country. These are legitimate achievements. 
What we have done with regard to global warming and the prevention of environmental degradation is also worthy of mention. We have been a leader in that area. And we have come up with ideas, with suggestions. Most recently, at the Rio Plus 20 conference, which President Rajapaksa attended. And these are areas where Sri Lanka has made a contribution which the world has taken note of. So in conclusion, commanders of the forces, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you that Sri Lanka has had to toil hard. These things have not come easily. But throughout our, country, throughout our history, our people have shown great resilience, resilience in facing difficult situations and bouncing back and carrying on with life with renewed vigor and vitality. So that is what you will encounter all over the island, wherever you visit, a certain mood of confidence in themselves and in the future. And it is my deep conviction that what the international community needs to do at this time is to reach out to us in a spirit of fraternity, goodwill, and friendship to support us in these efforts to move the country forward. So it is against that backdrop that you are holding this seminar, the defense seminar. I wish you well. I think the work that you have done, the plans that you have, the manner in which you are implementing those plans is something that is of interest not only to the people of our country, it has a broader significance. And this is why I welcome this as a timely and opportune initiative. It only remains for me to thank Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksa, the commander of the army, and all those who have been instrumental in organizing this to bestow on me the honor of inviting me to address you this morning. Thank you very much indeed.